Road Trippers, welcome to another episode of the Road Tripping Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Ward. And I am your host, Molly Malloy. And as always, it's great to have you tuning in. If this is your first episode, then welcome. If it's not your first episode, then welcome back. Each week, Molly and I take a drive along the information superhighway to find topics that we find interesting, obscure, funny, or downright bizarre, and then bring them to the show to share with you, our listeners, all in the hopes that we can make your commute suck just a little less. You can find all episodes at The Road Tripping Podcast for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or most anywhere you listen to podcasts. To stream or download our show on your mobile device, start by opening your app and typing The Road Tripping Podcast, that's tripping with a G, into the search bar. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to our feed so you'll have all the access to our previous shows, as well as all the future goodness we're planning on bringing your way. This will be a two-part series on, believe it or not, the life of Leroy Robert Ripley. This week, we will delve into his younger years and what led him to his work as a cartoonist. Next week, we will bring you the story of how he became the famous world traveler and entrepreneur that he was, about the strange things that fascinated him, and more, including where did all that money come from in the first place? All of that we will get to right after this. Molly, did you know that it's possible to get local fresh groceries delivered to your front door? Yes. In fact, I've been using Instacart for some time now, and it's great. It saves me so much time. I'm sure in your busy household, that's a serious plus. Absolutely. For example, just last week, I was sitting at my daughter's soccer game when my husband called to remind me that he was bringing his boss over for dinner and he couldn't wait for my famous lasagna. Well, it wasn't two seconds after I ended the call that I realized I still needed a few things for dinner, but the game had just started, so I couldn't leave. Instacart solved that for me with their app, and after a few clicks, I was able to order exactly what I needed. The best part was... The delivery was waiting by the garage door as soon as we got home. Yeah, but is it limited to certain stores or just to name brands? No, you can shop multiple stores and get the products you love. They even highlight deals and brands you may not have seen before. The Instacart shoppers pick the products you choose based on your preferences and make sure they are picked fresh and kept safe all the way to your door. That sounds great. How do I get signed up? Follow the link in the show notes or click on the Instacart banner on our homepage, the Road Tripping Podcast, that's tripping with a G, dot com, to let Instacart know that we sent you and support the show. Instacart, never set foot in a grocery store again. While the location of his birth, Santa Rosa, California, is not in question, exactly when Leroy Robert Ripley was born could never be pinned down especially if you asked him directly about it. For example, he would never admit to being born on February 22nd, 1890, the day most often cited, and would fill out any official documents like passport and visa applications by declaring 1891, 92, 93, or even 94 as his birth year. As for which day, he at one point claimed to have been born on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. He may have had a pretty good reason for that if the stories are to be believed, though, because his mother, 21-year-old Lily Bella Yaka was already four months pregnant with him when she married his father, 35-year-old Isaac Davis Ripley, in 1889. While we couldn't find anything that said Isaac wasn't the father, a premarital pregnancy was still very taboo at the time, as was her age and the difference in ages between them, nearly 14 years. The subterfuge was likely to spare his mother, or perhaps more likely himself, any humiliation from gossipers. For reference, the average age of couples getting married for the first time in the 1880s was 28 for men and 26 for women. It did fall lower for the working class, but was still only 22 for women at the time, so it would have been a scandalous event for multiple reasons. Called Roy by his parents, young Ripley was a lean boy with a high forehead, distinctive ears, freckles, a stuttering problem, and the set of large and skewed front teeth that caused him constant embarrassment and eventually leading to a debilitating shyness problem. It did not help him that the family had little money to spare 
forcing his mother to often make his clothes from recycled old dresses and leftovers from her laundry job. This earned him even more mocking by his peers when he wore his flower print shirts and pants she created to the one-room Lewis school he attended. Because of this, Roy often sought seclusion from others and spent much of his free time exploring the neighborhoods of his hometown, especially Chinatown, which he had the special fondness for, and reading or collecting things like bottle caps, cigar pans, and baseball cards. He even amassed a set of nails bent in the shape of each letter of the alphabet, though we couldn't find if he happened to find them like that or somehow made them like that for his own amusement. What he liked to do on his own the most, however, was to draw, and he was exceptionally good at it, though it often got him in trouble for not paying attention in class. He filled his notebooks, his bedroom walls, the attic of his home, and anywhere else he could with his work. During his junior year, after seeing how much of a struggle he had with writing, and even more so with giving speeches, his teacher, Fanny O'Mara, allowed him to turn in his assignments as drawings instead of writing essays, which spared him further embarrassment. She felt they were so masterfully done that she even used them to teach from. Regrettably, they were lost in the fire of 1921 that left the school completely destroyed. It wasn't just his physical appearance and talent for art that defined Ripley. His hometown of Santa Rosa was an incredibly unique place, it seems, and led interestingly to his development. By 1900, the once cowboy town had grown to a city of 6,000 and had attracted a multitude of different types of peoples to take up residence. You had your timbermen. This was Redwood country, after all. The road road workers. Vintners. Including the country's first female-owned vineyard and owner of the land that Santa Rosa was founded upon. Farmers. Yellow journalists. Think fake news and sensationalism to the extreme. Prospectors and miners who were digging for gold, silver, mercury, and limestone. As well as interesting religious figures like Thomas Lake Harris, founder of the Brotherhood of the New Life. Harris claimed to have found the secret of the resuscitation of humanity. His followers so strongly believed that he had attained the secret of immortal life on Earth that even after he died in 1906, declared that he was only sleeping. It was three whole months before it was acknowledged publicly that he really was dead. While that is strange, only in a believe it or not world could you have even imagined that Harris's successor, Kaneya Nagasawa, would be the son of a samurai who had been smuggled out of Japan as part of the first students from Japan to study in the UK. Remember, at this time, foreign travel was illegal in Japan due to the fact that the kingdom was still wary of outsider influence in their culture. Santa Rosa was also a regular stopping point for the circus circuit, and shows like the Ringling Brothers Circus, Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which you can hear more about for free in episode number six, and Bartum and Bailey's Greatest Show on Earth were regular occurrences. When these shows were not in town, the local novelty theater hosted midget shows, no offense meant, as the term is being used in a historical context, a bone-playing musician, and a boxing kangaroo. Even Ripley's mother's church became an oddity within the city that intrigued him, though not for its religious aspects. You see, the original home of the First Baptist Church of Santa Rosa is also known as the Church of One Tree. This is because it was built literally from one tree, a massive 275-foot tall, or 84 meters, 18-foot wide, or 5.5 meters, in diameter, California redwood. The tree produced 78,000 board feet of lumber when it was milled in 1873. It interested Ripley so much that he later would turn it into one of his famous museums. Fun fact. In the early 1900s, Santa Rosa was home of the regional line of Northwestern Pacific Railroad that serviced the area between Petaluma and Sebastopol as part of their operations. When the Santa Rosa Street Railway and the Union Street Railway of Santa Rosa, the Petaluma Street Railroad, and the Central Street Railway were consolidated to form the Petaluma and Santa Rosa Railway, which was an electric trolley system servicing the same area. They were obviously upset about that. As the electric lines were strong, it was determined that the trolley would need to use a crossing that belonged to the railroad. 
who would not consent as it would take away their customers. By November, the steam railroad stationed guards at the proposed crossing site to prevent cutting of its rails. Trolley service began to the west side of the crossing on December 1, 1904. Rails were laid on the east side of the steam railroad tracks and an electric wire was strung overhead in preparation for installing the crossing. A threatened boycott of the steam railroad by 92 Santa Rosa merchants had no effect. This led to what became as the Battle of Sebastopol Road in January of 1905. A crossing was prefabricated in Sebastopol and moved the crossing location. But when the crew arrived to install the crossing, they were greeted by a pair of steam locomotives on either side of the crossing, fitted with steam nozzles to spray hot water on anyone approaching, causing the construction crew to retreat. The following day, the construction crew arrived early and in secret before the railway could station their trains again at the crossing. The construction crew laid temporary tracks across and over the steam rails and had a team of horses pull them across to serve downtown Santa Rosa. The railway did obtain a temporary injunction from a San Francisco judge prohibiting installation of the crossing. For a few weeks, passengers from Sebastopol were required to depart their arriving trolley and walk over the steam railway to reboard another trolley for the remainder of the trip. The injunction was dissolved in late February, and the construction crew assembled again to install the crossing on March 1, 1905. The railway, unaware of the status of their injunction, had their locomotives again spray the crews with hot water to keep them back until the special train arrived with 150 San Francisco waterfront thugs hired to discourage the construction crew. The railroad also had a flat cart loaded with gravel on hand for the men to fill in the evacuation as soon as any digging occurred. Tempers flared, and several hundred Santa Rosa citizens assembled to watch the entertainment. Santa Rosa police ultimately restored order, and the crossing was installed that evening. Northwestern had the last laugh in the end, however, as the trolley line eventually became unprofitable and the railroad bought them out. By 1905, 15-year-old Ripley had made a few friends, and though still teased, his artistic talent was starting to win over some of his detractors. He was starting to feel as if he fit in. However, that year would see his world be turned upside down by devastating tragedy. We will continue the story after this word from today's show partner. Oh, God. No God here. Terror awaits you with the Frightmare Theater Podcast, a monthly horror audio drama series from Arcane, available now wherever you unearth your favorite podcasts. Join us. It'll be a scream. <laughs> In the summer of 1905, Ripley lost his grandmother to a lung hemorrhage soon after she moved to Santa Rosa to be closer to the family. While heartbreaking for sure, in September that year, Ripley endured the loss of his father, Isaac, due to heart failure. This would ultimately change the direction his life would take because the family no longer had a primary breadwinner, and his mother, while industrious, had little to no skills that would earn enough money to support herself, Ripley, and his two younger siblings. So, even though he tried to continue going to high school and being a normal kid, doing normal kid things like joining the yearbook and school's newspaper letter staff, his mother needed him to get a job and help the family. He got an early morning paper route that he absolutely hated, and by early 1906, he had quit. This is said to have possibly saved his life because at 5.12 a.m., on the morning of April 18, 1906, when all of the paper boys were starting work, California experienced the deadliest earthquake in U.S. history. Thought to be somewhere between 7.9 and 8.3 on the Richter scale, lasting approximately 60 seconds. 700 deaths are officially credited to the event, including at least four paper boys 
who worked for the local paper, The Press Democrat. More recent number projections conclude that more than 3,000 people lost their lives from the quake and the aftermath. While it would historically be known as the Great San Francisco Earthquake, Santa Rosa sustained proportionally more damage than any other city with the highest per capita death toll. A hundred citizens lost their life that day. A joint earthquake edition of San Francisco's newspaper even declared Santa Rosa is a total wreck. The loss of family and the loss of his hometown spurred Ripley into making the decision that he wanted to get away from Santa Rosa as soon as he was able. During his junior year, believe it or not, Ripley discovered he was actually a very good baseball player, even managing to make a local semi-professional team. He spent time playing left field, second base, and some time as a pitcher where he had a wicked curveball. Ripley dreamed of perhaps one day playing for his favorite team, the New York Giants, after high school, but his mother continuously tried to persuade him, like all mothers do, I think, to get a real job because he was too smart to waste time on art and baseball. She even suggested to him that he should consider a life as a minister to that of a baseball player or he would be doomed to slowly die of starvation since there was no money to be made playing. Little would she know that one of the assignments he was given later in life while working for the New York Globe would be to cover the giant spring training and give him the opportunity he had dreamed of. While covering the team, somehow the coaches learned he had played semi-pro and asked him to train with the team. That in and of itself would make any boy's hood dream come true. But for Ripley, it got better. That curveball really impressed the coaches. He was put into a training game, and somehow, we could not find out exactly how, he either broke his arm or his finger, which was the end of his baseball career and ensured he would pursue his first love of art as a cartoonist. Ripley did do work to support his family, though. Some odd jobs here and there, like painting porches, doing yard work, even loading wagons helped to bring in so much needed money. At one point, Ripley even worked at the Fisher & Kinslow Marble Works as a tombstone polisher, which Ripley found too gloomy. He desperately wanted to find a place where he fit in and could use his talents for a living. Seeing advertisements for staff artists and illustrators in the paper, with salaries of $1,000 or more a year, the equivalent of $27,000 today, Ripley decided to try his hand at a new world of comics. So, in late 1907, he mailed a one-panel cartoon to Life Magazine Publishing House in New York. The sketch was of a pretty woman standing beside a wooden wash tub with steam coming up from the water in the tub. She made a show of running wet clothes through a hand crank twin roller ringing machine with a thin smile on her face. Her hair was in a tight bun, her sleeves rolled up and wearing an ankle-length dress. Playing with the clever homonyms of bell, as in beauty, not church bell, and ringing, as in twisting out water from the clothes instead of striking a bell, his caption read, the village bell was slowly ringing. It was his first work sent outside of Santa Rosa, and it became his first real paid cartooning work. It earned him $8, or roughly $220, when it appeared in the June 18, 1908 edition of Life magazine, on page 3, and opened his eyes to the possibility of living his dreams. It was a good thing that Ripley sent in that sketch, as he never imagined to graduate quitting in the spring of his senior year of 1908. He would later tell the tell that he had to go to work to support his family, but the local sports pages showed more evidence of his playing ball than he wanted to admit to, which was most likely the cause for him failing to graduate. In the summer of 1908, Ripley met Carol Reed Ennis, a freelance reporter who boarded from his mother while she was in Santa Rosa for a story. She saw something special in Ripley that most people at the time never did. Promise and talent. She convinced Ripley to sketch up a series of cartoon panels about an upcoming political race and a few sports-related ones that she took back to San Francisco to show her friends and colleagues. One of the people to view his work was Fremont Older, 
the editor of the San Francisco Bulletin and the largest paper east of Chicago. He liked Ripley's work and showed it to his brother-in-law, Highland Baggerly, who was the sports editor who also thought the boy had talent. In February of 1909, Baggerly wrote to Ripley and told him that he had very favorable opinions of his work and if they would come to agreement on a salary, he would like to hire him. Ripley, of course, agreed and started with the paper for $8 a week with the promise of a raise of $2 more if he made good. Ripley was going to be in good hands as Baggerly was the editor who helped launch the careers of cartoonist Rube Goldberg and Tag Dorgan. Ripley left Santa Rosa for San Francisco soon after he received that letter, which he kept all his life. He was about to embark on his dream of being a cartoonist and a well-paid one for a 19-year-old with no high school diploma. He never lived in Santa Rosa ever again. Be sure to tune in, or better yet, be sure to subscribe for part two of this series to learn how Leroy Robert Ripley went from being a very poor unknown artist to being the world famous and extremely wealthy. Well, that is all the time we have for in this episode of the Road Tripping Podcast. But if you liked it and want to hear more, please subscribe to the show feed and give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast directory. The more positive reviews we receive, the more trippers will be able to find us, the faster we will grow, thus able to bring you new content. Be sure to visit our website, theroadtrippingpodcast.com, that's tripping with a G, to keep updated on future shows, leave show suggestions, and to see all the ways to find and interact with us all in one place. If you're able and feeling generous, then a link to our Patreon page can be found under the support link on the homepage. We have been your hosts, Dean Ward and Molly Molloy, and the Road Tripping Podcast is recorded and produced at Before Midnight Studio. As always, until next we meet, stay safe, trippers.